So first thing is I want to thank all of you uh, for coming. I, um, I also want to thank uh, Mark Williams and Terry for organizing this, co-chairing this. I want to thank Geisinger for handling a lot of the logistical aspects and really hosting this in many ways. I, I would also um, point out that uh, a it's a good thing we decided to start this when we did. Originally, we were going to start this a little later to allow some of us from Washington to fly in this morning. Uh, the federal government's officially closed, in case you didn't know this right now, not because of the fiscal cliff, because of a little teeny bit of ice in the Washington, D.C. area. So we're actually closed in the D.C. area to noon, but fortunately, all of us decided to come in last night, so we're here and we can get going. Um, it is interesting to look out at this group and see how it has grown. I think the, I think the origins of this, of this meeting, this gathering, was Jeff Ginsburg telling us once at an advisory meeting, wouldn't it be great if we started getting together? And then we had Genomic Medicine One, and it was a reasonably uh, modest-sized group, and it's grown two, three, four, uh, and so forth. I'm projecting by the time the, f the way the field is going and the way this uh, group seems to be expansive in its thinking, which I love, I'm, I'm pretty sure by Genomic Medicine 10, we're going to have it in Madison Square Gardens or somewhere that'll be a massive venue. It's amazing to see the depth and breadth of people interested in this, and I think you can see from the agenda, uh, we won't disappoint. The other thing I want to point out um, uh, f from the point of view of the National Human Genome Research Institute is a subtlety, but I think it's relevant and you're going to see it play out a little bit during this meeting, some of the people you interact with. The origins of this were very much around genomic medicine, narrowly defined, coming out of um, things we were talking about programmatically we were going to be doing, especially under Terry Manolio's leadership. I'm not going to give you many of the details, but in this previous October 1, the Institute went through a fairly substantial reorganization, the first one in a very long time, and we created a whole new divisional structure that really, I think, better defined what we're doing very broadly in genomics. And the reason I raise that is Terry is the director of one of our divisions, the Division of Genomic Medicine, but the issues and topics and things being discussed at this meeting really are not solely in her division. In fact, many of the things we're going to be talking about here are very relevant to some of the other divisions. Laura Rodriguez is right here, who's our director of our Division of uh, Policy, Communication, and Education, and several of her members of her division are here. You're going to be hearing from some of them. Um, and then meanwhile, I'm going to even have a few remarks to say about some of the things going on in our intramural division that I think are relevant, and I think some of the other divisions are going to, so I just want to make that point because our view is expansive, and I think our structure uh, uh, very much reflects that. And with time on some of these topics, you're going to hear about an update from another meeting that um, somebody, uh, that Derek Scholes will be talking about later. You will see how different parts of the Institute might be adopting and running with issues and topics that get raised at venues like this. So if for my talk, what I wanted to do was to just fill in the gaps in many ways. I know what some of the other members of the Institute talk about throughout the next two days. I was sort of given table scraps, if you will, but they're good table scraps. They're sort of eclectic topics that are not being covered by others, um, but people told me, oh, you really should make sure to say a few words about the other because we're not covering it. So these are the four things that I want to just give you some brief updates about to set the context. They are a little bit all over the place. The last one in particular is fun because I thought it'd be good to have a fun topic at the very beginning to get everybody all energized, although the other stuff's pretty exciting too. Let me just remind you, and I want to start with our education efforts, um, and needless to say, this is something that's been relevant to the Institute for a long time. Many of you might have seen this uh, a recent cover and story in genome technology that focused on education as it relates to physicians. The fact of the matter is NHGRI has been interested in genomics uh, education uh, broader, more broadly defined than just uh, physicians, and even within the healthcare setting, more broadly defined than, than just physicians. I would actually tell you that it's an important component of our overall mission. And as in, in very much in line with telling you about our reorganization, there are elements of educational programs that are found in different components, different divisions, different subparts of our divisions, and so forth. We really regard it as a long-term goal to advance the understanding of healthcare, prov healthcare providers, broadly defined, about advances in science and technology and evidence development, and this very much will be relevant to some of the things we'll be talking about um, throughout this meeting. And clearly, we recognize that these educational efforts, whoever carries them out, and we probably will only carry out a small fraction of what's going to be required. It's going to be critically important to assure productive utility of genomic information for clinical care because of all the complexities of genomics and all the different ways that it touches. 
When you read our strategic plans, either in 2003 or more recently in 2011, our most recent strategic plan, we talk about some of these ideas, obviously in very um, simple terms, recognizing that there's a lot of complexities that need to be worked through at venues such as this. Our efforts and the resources that we've created um, have been uh, several, and just a subset of which, uh, but at least the major ones, are shown here. Um, some of you might be familiar with uh, the, the G2C2 resource repository that's had uh, curriculum and other resource materials for genetic counseling education, nursing, physician's assistant. Coming soon will be for pharmacists, and, uh, and that has served as a venue uh, that has been useful for individuals in the community. Our talking glossary has received quite a bit of utility around the world as a product of our education uh, branch within um, one of our divisions. Um, the case scenarios uh, being created within this new G3C uh, resource, um, which will be uh, in transdisciplinary in nature and is, is, will find uh, usage of value to many individuals. And then most recently, we have an ongoing series, again, from. Um, within uh, one of our divisions sponsoring and actually involving many people across the institute in partnership with Suburban Hospital and Johns Hopkins University. We have a series of uh, genomics and medicine lecture series held in a small auditorium in Suburban Hospital, but videotaped every single week uh, that it's held and posted on our genome.gov and also our genome TV channel of YouTube and getting extensive amounts of usage. So again, we look for opportunities for these sorts of outreach and education efforts. And so these are the kind, and then meanwhile, in terms of the literature, uh, we've had various uh, involvement over the years uh, in terms of getting uh, information about genomics and genomics education and genomic medicine out on the clinical journals. Greg Firo and I wrote an article a couple of years ago for an education issue of JAMA. Some of you might be familiar with our New England Journal of Medicine series that members of the Institute uh, uh, co edited for a number of years. And then a, a special issue that's pending, a genomics issue in Journal of Nursing Scholarship, Gene J Jenkins has been heavily involved in, that'll be coming um, out uh, quite soon. So those have been just sort of a flavor of our um, education efforts, but we look for audiences like this to tell us what are the other priorities we might be interested in, in supporting or looking into in the future. Moving on then, again, to a complete change of topic, I wanted to, uh, I was asked to say a few words about the Undiagnosed Diseases Program which originally grew up exclusively in the intramural program of NIH, and we hosted it within NHGRI. For those of you who are not familiar with this program, it is a program um, that aims to assist patients with unknown disorders reach an accurate diagnosis. These are these tragic cases where have gone from um, hospital system to hospital system, unable to come up with a diagnosis, um, and they come to NIH, in this case so far, to the intramural program for rigorous workup, um, often extensive genomic characterization in an attempt to identify um, the disorder affecting that individual. And the goal also includes discovering new diseases that to human physiology and genetics. Uh, to date, over about over 500 patients, these numbers are actually old, over 500 patients have been evaluated at the NIH Clinical Center, definitive diagnosis over 39 at this point, and at least uh, 16 new human genetic disorders have been identified. The Undiagnosed Diseases Program was a pilot project that was uh, viewed as an experimental to see what it was like, and I think it was widely regarded as being extremely successful, and so successful that when it came time to evaluating its that it was important to expand this, put it on longer-term financial footing on behalf of The decision was made by the NIH leadership to move it out of what was basically a temporary budgetary circumstance um, over a pilot phase and to make it a common fund project, part of the NIH common fund. And that indeed is exactly what's happening, and we're right in the midst of that transition, a commitment over $145 million over a seven-year period, at least initially, for common, some, common fund support involved not only continuing to support the intramural UDP program, but expand this to a national UDP network. And in fact, that was a strong uh, urging of an advisory group uh, that we convened, an external advisory group that had been helping us with the Undiagnosed Diseases Program, and we were fortunate to be able to identify resources to make that a reality. It is envisioned the creation of a network of something like five to seven extra. Oh, by the way, needless to say, all common fund projects have to have institutes help coordinate and run them and NHGRI is uh, one of the three lead institutes and centers involved in leading the Common Fund, and in fact, we have people here from NHGRI who are heavily involved in coordinating this and, and programmatically developing this as it becomes reality. Um, the, along the way, the idea is to create this as a network and to have more robust, having a group of 
experts involved in this and improving the data storage access and analysis, both the phenotypic data, clinical data, um, and especially the genomic data coming out from the studies of these individuals. Um, it also it will be an arm that will involve researchers to elucidate the mechanisms of disease. Oftentimes they get down to the point of having a gene identified or a genetic defect, having no idea what the basic science mechanisms that lead to that disease. We want to facilitate those studies. As well. It involves training and fellowship programs for rare disease diagnostics that are in the early planning phases. And so, uh, in those of you who are interested and some of you might be familiar with, there is an RFA that recently applications came in on for the creation of a coordinating center that will be coordinating this network. An upcoming review is pending. And then RFA, uh, shows our program announcement right now uh, involves uh, facilitating gene function studies to investigate rare and undiagnosed diseases, and the receipt date is coming up um, later next month. So stay tuned. There will be more. And there, if anybody who's interested in learning more, there are people here um, like Terry Manolio, Jean Passamani, who could tell you many details and, uh, about this and point you in the right direction as this rapidly evolving takes place. On to a third, um, again, interrelated but seemingly eclectic topic, I also wanted to tell you about another major development going on at NIH, which I think touches things in genomic medicine, but it's far broader than genomic medicine. And it relates to the surrounding uh, big data, computational biology, bioinformatics, ever the recognition of one of the areas of greatest um, um, impedance uh, mismatching between the ability to generate data and being able to analyze it. And here, there is some breaking news that I can tell you that some of you will be interested in, either because it will directly affect you or because you will recognize this is sorely needed in biomedical research right now. Uh, I think all of you would agree, the largest bottleneck in biomedical research, metaphor, and there's many metaphors. It's either the data coming out of uh, any of these new technologies, um, uh, be sequencing technologies or Technologies. It's like drinking water from a fire hose, or is it like a tsunami of data, or whether it's an avalanche of data, pick whatever you want. The truth is, us here, those of us in biomedical research and clinical research, find ourselves in the big data era. Once upon a time, just for climatologists, once upon a time, uh, just for particle physicists, now we're here. And it is an awkward place to be at this moment in time where we can generate data far faster than we can analyze that data. Now, I stand here, obviously, speaking as a genomicist, and clearly, genomics is one of the many types of data that's creating this big data problem. It's not just genomics when it comes to NI, this NIH bottleneck. There are other omic technologies that are coming forth. There clearly are imaging technologies that have greatly accelerated the pace of, of generating data either at a cellular level or an organismal level or an Clearly, phenotypic data, something I know many of you are interested in, and exposure data, especially as technologies become better, and then clinical data, which, of course, is very relevant. Recognizing the importance of this area and NIH feeling overwhelmed about this, Francis Collins appointed a working group of his advisory committee to the director uh, about two years ago now, um, and that for a year they studied this, and then about six or eight months ago they formally uh, issued a report, which is at this URL if you're interested in reading it, the report of the data and informatics working group. And the bottom line is there are major changes that are now taking place at NIH because of the recommendations of this report. We are tackling the big data program, uh, the big data problem. I'm happy to tell you about this. Um, um, first of all, the position that we'd be recruiting for is something called an associate director for data science. Um, I've actually been asked to be the acting director in the interim, but we'll be launching a search. It's a very high level leadership position to the NIH director. There will also be creation of a new group at NIH, internal to NIH, called the Scientific Data Council that will be responsible for many things, including strategic planning in the area of big data, broadly defined. It will also be responsible for a new trans-NIH initiative known as Big Data to Knowledge, which will be a new program that will be jump-started by in the long run over a seven-year period. It will be completely um, supported by contributions from all of the institutes recognizing this as a trans-NIH problem. This new initiative, which will begin next fiscal year, will have four major components. I'm just going to touch on them, recognizing that there's a, there's a lot under the hood here, and I'm happy to talk to any of you about it or, at break. Major programs to, and, and policy changes to facilitate broad use of biomedical big data, developing methods and software for biomedical big data, 
enhancing training for biomedical big data. That would include kinds of data we'll be talking about here, and also establishing for biomedical big data. So these are all things that you can imagine if it's starting next fiscal year, we're going to be very active in getting off the ground if the funding starts then. That's not that long from now. And so needless to say, you can stay tuned and you will be hearing much more about it. The good news here is there's a major commitment. At times of fiscal constraint, there's a major trans-NIH commitment to try to fix the big data problem in biomedical research, and we're going to be doing this in a very aggressive timetable. Finally, and I think I'm one minute away from getting the finger from Terry Manolio, I'm going to end you on a very happy note, uh, tell you some exciting things going on in 2013. Why is 2013 exciting? It's a celebratory year for us. Recall, it'll be the 60th anniversary of the Watson Crick double helical structure discovery and description, and the 10th anniversary in April of the completion of the Human Genome Project. Recognizing this as a marvelous time, especially other things being tough these days, we need to celebrate, we need to embrace, we need to talk about this remarkable, especially the 10th anniversary of completing the Human Genome Project. There are many things the Institute is planning. You may want to look at this URL. This website is now live, and it talks about a lecture series that we're going to be having at NIH, an all-day symposium in April, all of which will be video cast and videotaped and video archived. All of you will be able to see, and there'll be some, like, we've lined up terrific speakers for all of this, and there'll be other things that will be happening. In particular, though, what I want to tell you about is this new partnership that we have with the Smithsonian Institute, where there will be a genome exhibition um, that will open in June um, of this year. Um, this exhibition uh, is, is just a, a, a pretty looking uh, uh, design uh, representation of it is shown here. It's at the very advanced stage of design. In fact, in my hotel rooms, the 95% design that I'm reviewing actively. Um, and it, it is going to be fantastic. It's going to open at the Smithsonian's Natural History, National Museum of Natural History. Vince Bonham is here at the meeting, and he is spending you know, 50 hours a week working on this project, and uh, he and his staff. It's been a marvelous. And I tell you, we got a shout out in Nature at the beginning of this year. First issue, they talked about one of the exciting things happening in science and art, and that's this exhibition. And in addition to this exhibition, I will tell you there'll be a significant amount of education and outreach planning and programmatic activities under Vence's leadership, um, a lot of web resource materials and so forth, and it's going to be spectacular. So I want everybody in this room to commit that they will come to Washington, D.C. sometime after mid-June of this year. It will be at the Smithsonian's Hall 23, just 23 pairs of human chromosomes, easy to remember, right next to the Hope Diamond. Hard to forget, just follow the crowd. And come see our exhibition. It'll be there for one year, after which it will travel for about four to five years around North America. One of the coolest things I've been involved in, and I've been involved in some pretty cool things. So this has been a lot of fun, and we're happy to tell you more about it, but I wanted to end on that note. So I will stop there, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks. Thank you, Eric. Uh, we may have time for one or two very quick questions. Yep. Seeing none, um, <laughs> Mira, why don't you go? Finger <laughs> too. You can. Uh, uh, you can definitely catch Eric throughout the meeting. So uh, please do so, Mira. You can go ahead and go up. There's one other person that we should highlight that we um, uh, that we didn't, and that's uh, Gene Passamani, who uh, um, uh, introduced himself. Uh, he's uh, with NHGRI, and he really has been. Um, uh, key to uh, pulling all the uh, organizations together and, and, and uh, organizing, and we'll be uh, working to uh, summarize the, the output of the meeting. So uh, we wanted to identify him as a key contributor. So thank you, Gene.